Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get rolling. Um, I want to start out to see if anybody has any questions about the upcoming midterm, which is, oh my, Friday. Um, I tried to be clear about what we're expecting. I uh, had some questions about studying and stuff like that, but were there any things that came up about the midterm? Yeah, so, okay, question came up. When a star score is said to be generate, are we saying it's held up by degeneracy pressure? Yes, uh, almost always that means electron degeneracy pressure, um, and a uh, star is not fusing in a degenerate core. Uh, one of the truisms of stellar astrophysics is that if you ignite fusion in a stellar, in a degenerate core, it is unstable and leads to explosions. Uh, that's type 1a supernova uh, or thermonuclear supernova come off that, that way, as does the helium flash at the tip of the red giant branch. Uh, also, is any photo ID required for the midterm? Um, no, I, I don't have a feasible way of checking that. Um, so like, let's try to have a minimum BS uh, in visualating experience. And then uh, if, you, if some rando shows up at the uh, final exam who turns out to be you uh, and it wasn't the person at the midterm, then we might have an issue. Uh, but really the only thing I'm expecting is that you have your cameras on during the Zoom uh, invigilation. And that's mostly because I had this um, interesting experience of watching my spouse uh, invigilate her final exam for a medical school course she is in. And I was just watching one of the students sitting there happily chatting on her cell phone uh, while taking a final exam, to which I just had one of these like, wait, what, what's going on here? So it's really just to head off the most egregious of collaborative uh, practices there. Uh, but uh, given the structuring of the exam, it's sort of set up so it's difficult to do collaborative cheating anyways. So I'm hoping that we can just kind of be relaxed. The point is feedback to you, um, not necessarily for me to you know break your souls. Um, that could be an interesting byproduct, but you know, that's... Uh, the, the hope is that this is relatively laid back. Uh, will we keep our mics on during the exam? Uh, no, I think that that's probably just a terrible uh, experience for all involved. It would be better for the visualization experience, but if somebody happens to have a dog decide to go barking in the background or something, that ends up ruining everybody's experience. So, you know, I had to sort of trade off like experiences. So I think mics off are probably probably the way to go. Uh, can we use online calculators during the exam? Uh, yeah, the expectation is that I don't want you to um, be using, you know, Chegg and other people, uh, but you are welcome to Wolfram Alpha it up. Um, this is basically, you can interact with anything that doesn't involve a human. Other logistical questions? All right, so uh, the goal is that you show up on Friday, you have cameras ready uh, and on, so I'll get to see your sunny faces in many tiny cases for the very first time. I'm very excited about this prospect. Uh, and then uh, there will be uh, a two-part exam on the E-class. It will appear mysteriously at the beginning of the exam period, and you just log into E-class and it will be in that top block of content. So you just go in and you click midterm part one and you'll do the multiple choice section. And when you finish midterm part one, go ahead and uh, the that will unlock the free response. You open up the free response, you work through the problems on your own paper or tablets or whatever and upload images. I understand that there can be some lag or whatever. The goal is just to get me the uh, exam content here. Uh, if anything looks really fishy, I may uh, have to have a chat with you and just sort of say, look, you know, this, this looks totally sketchy. Would you be okay if we just transferred the weight here to the final exam? Uh, if, I, if anything weird goes on, I'll still be marking your paper because the point is feedback, but at the same time, we should maintain some integrity. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Last call for questions. All right, so 
Let's hope this goes okay. Uh, there's nothing like a midterm to make E class want to fall over. So let's uh, let's uh, propitiate whatever deities in the server room you uh, subscribe to, and we'll hope that things stay up and running. Uh, we'll muddle through somehow, I'm sure. Okay, I'm gonna switch to stuff that is not on the exam right now. Uh, which are uh, one of the last aspects of simple stellar population, uh, which is binary stars. Or binary stars is a bit of a misnomer because there are multiple stars. And so a more general way of presenting this is in terms of what we call the companion frequency. And so the companion frequency is basically the number of stars in a stellar population that are found in multiple uh, star systems over the uh, total number of stars. And so that means that you know binaries count as uh, two stars, triples count as three stars, quadruples count as four stars, and they have found stellar systems with like up to seven members in them that are all bound together and kind of whizzing around each other gravitationally. Uh, said stellar systems tend to be unstable and kick out a lot of their members. Uh, yeah, and then um, you end up sort of reducing and stuff. So st binary dynamics are fascinating, and it leads to some very cool um, stellar astrophysics. A lot of the processing of binaries is what leads to things like these kilonova uh, that we've talked to, or thermonuclear explosions, is stars interacting with each other. Because as we'll see when we get into dynamics, random stars don't interact with each other at all. If you have one star and another star in the galaxy, then they will all, mo yeah, they will not collide. It's just a very high probability kind of thing. Uh, but you do have stars that are in these multiple systems. And usually when you have things in more than a binary system, they tend to be in what's called a hierarchical triple. Uh, and so uh, just for context, uh, the North Star, Polaris, is a member of a hierarchical triple. And the reason why I want to focus on tri uh, Polaris is I happen to have a um, Polaris right here in a binary star system, and uh, Polaris A, which is the big star, and Polaris B, which is the chibi little, little uh, uh, star here, are together in a tight little binary system. And uh, they're um, magnetized so that if you stick it on correctly, the, they'll hold hands here because, you know, that's what happens. Okay, so uh, they're here in this close to binary system and they're going around their common center of mass uh, like that. And then you have Polaris B, which hangs out at a much larger orbit, orbiting around uh, the system here. So, yeah, all right. Uh, and so what this means is that it maintains gravitational stability. Usually when you have like three stars in close binary orbits, they'll end up going unstable and ejecting one of the stars from the system. But uh, in this case, uh, we have this hierarchical system, which is far more stable because these two stars kind of act as a single point mass. And then this other star goes in orbit around it. Anyways, uh, so, you know, hierarchical triples are great. And, you know, the fact that they make stuffed uh, super giant stars is also pretty awesome. I think the one thing that I find somewhat, uh, just as an aside, obnoxious about this particular rendition is that Polaris A is a F71 star, which tells you it's a super giant and a spectral class F, but Polaris AB and Polaris B are F3 and F5 stars, respectively. And so I look at this and I say, well, you know, the spectral types of these stars are pretty close. They should all be about the same color because that's one of the ways you correlate with spectral type. So, you know, manufacturing decisions are not necessarily astrophysically accurate, but I do appreciate that they all work out. So anyways, uh, yeah. The small joys in life are finding higher stuffed hierarchical troubles, uh, triples in uh, observatory gift shops. But anyways, I have uh, digressed long enough uh, on Polaris, but it, you know, something that will uh, hopefully stick with you. The things that you want to say about binary systems uh, for the purposes of um, uh, understanding uh, stars themselves is this uh, case where the fraction uh, or the number of stars typically found in a system 
rises with the primary mass. And when we say the primary mass, uh, down here. The primary mass is the mass of the most massive star in the system. Uh, and there is this curve where you can see here, uh, these are two different mass ratio bins from this basically this huge journal article by Mo and Di Stefano. Uh, the low mass ratios, so Q is basically the ratio of the prime, uh, uh, the secondaries or over the primaries, uh, those extreme mass ratios at the bottom, and then sort of more equal mass ratios here at the top. It's basically, it's a similar uh, behavior with a slight difference in scale. And what you see uh, here is that there's this rise with primary mass. More massive stars tend to be found in binary or multiple systems. Uh, and um, high mass stars, this is not shown in this diagram, but things above 10 solar masses tend to be twins. Uh, they, you tend to find a bunch of O stars in a binary or multiple system together, rather more, far more than you would expect from the random nature of the star formation process. Uh, below about one solar mass, this multiplicity fraction drops off precipitously. So, uh, um, brown dwarfs, uh, or sorry, red dwarfs and brown dwarfs tend to be single stars. So, you know, most stars tend to be single only because red dwarfs and brown dwarfs are most stars. Uh, but most of the stars that we see in the sky, which tend to be higher mass stars because they're more luminous, uh, those tend to be in binary systems. So if you look up at night, almost all of those systems that you can visibly see are multiple or binary star systems. Our sun is somewhat of a rarity by having only a single star in it uh, for its mass. Well, let's just say it's about a 50-50 uh, rarity. Uh, uh, you know, otherwise you wouldn't have that. Uh, this is all a uh, byproduct of the star formation process. Uh, binaries are one of the ways that you dump angular momentum uh, from the system. As you uh, have gravitational collapse of material, you need to do something with that angular momentum. And the uh, one of the obvious things that nature tends to do is to dump it into the orbital angular momentum. Why am I doing that one? I'm sorry. Into the orbital angular momentum of binary star systems. Uh, so that's where a lot of the angular momentum ends up. Uh, final note is that binaries are nearly always coeval, which means that these stars form together and they will grow old and uh, uh, evolve together. And so that's, uh, it's very, very rare that you will actually get a capture binary where something is sailing through space and gets caught into a binary system. That really only happens in the ultra high stellar density environments of globular clusters, which are these very old, very high density clusters. All right, I wanted to lay out those important facts about binaries just so you uh, get a sense of like where this binary sequence comes from and the properties that we tend to see associated with it. All right, our goal now is to really understand this diagram and all the factors that are in it. So uh, we sort of laid out some of the cases of things we need to explain for next time uh, or over the next few weeks is to understand how star formation history and the variations of metallicity through the process of enrichment lead to non-simple stellar populations. This is not that razor thin main sequence HR diagram. We understand how the processes that play out in the galaxy lead to this much more complicated diagram. We need to understand observational effects like the biases that affect the number of stars. And finally, we'll do a little bit more dwelling on the nature of dust uh, and its influence of reddening and extinction. So the first question we want to kind of guide is, is, if you look at this, the color scale in the diagram here shows that most of the stars in this system are basically sun-like. Um, you know, the, the peak of the color brightness is here at an early G-type star. And that's maybe an F star. So that's kind of weird. Why? What factors would lead to the stars being basically uh, sunlight, even though we know that the initial mass function of star formation produces way more brown red dwarfs than it does solar type stars? Well, it's kind of a poser, but first, 
this is shaped by the fact that we collected these data. This is the stars that we see, not the stars that there are. And we have to deal with a luminosity bias. Uh, we basically, I asked you about this on, I think, homework set two, where we can see more luminous objects over a much larger volume than we can see faint objects. So if we think about red dwarfs here, this is showing our you know, solar system down here in the red, and then we have all these little red uh, dwarfs scattered around us, and there's some limiting magnitude uh, that allows us to see stars out to that distance and no further. But more luminous objects, like A0 stars, you could see out to a larger object just because they're more luminous and the inverse square law causes their light to get fainter and fainter, but it's starting from a higher threshold and therefore it reaches the observational limit uh, after traveling a larger distance. And we describe this often in terms of the completeness volume. The volume over which a survey is complete is meaning we see all objects of that type. So the volume over which uh, the Gaia survey is complete for M0 stars is much smaller than the volume to which uh, Gaia is complete for A0 stars, just because A0 stars are more luminous. So given those pieces, we can turn things over to you. And I ask you, okay, if we can reliably detect stars down to a magnitude of G equals 15, that's the Gaia G band, how far away can Gaia detect a star with absolute magnitude MG? Oh, uh, it's LUW, right there. Um, uh, how far can away can the Gaia detect a star with MG uh, like a brown dwarf near the fusion boundary, and I want to know that in uh, parsecs. I will note that a very helpful equation is the distance modulus equation. m minus m is 5 log 10 d over 10 parsecs. All right, as we're closing in here, we uh, can solve this equation by substituting uh, in the two values here. G uh, goes in for the magnitude and MG goes in for the absolute magnitude. These are the same number. Hmm. Okay, five minus, 15 minus 15 is five log 10 D over 10 parsecs. Uh, that is another way of writing zero, and then we feed the five to the zero. Um, nom, 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 nom. So we get zero 
is equal to log 10 d over 10 parsecs. Exponentiate both sides, raise it to the power of 10. Uh, so 10 to the 0 is equal to d over 10 parsecs is equal to 1. And so d is equal to 10 parsecs. That's totally a 10 parsec. Uh, any questions on how that played out? Nope. 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 And... Yeah. So a lot of people like in 10. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Awesome. All right. So cool. Well, uh, that gives us that sense. Well, that is where how far we can see a brown dwarf near the fusion boundary. 10 parsecs. Not very far. What about something with an absolute magnitude of minus five, which is one of these big, massive, luminous stars at 50 solar masses. Uh, okay. How far away can we see that? So again, m minus m is equal to five log 10 d over 10 parsecs. All right, come along here. So similar values here, we just do 15 minus negative five. That's the thing we gotta be careful of is five log 10 d over 10 parsecs. That's 20 over five is equal to log 10 d over 10 parsecs. So that's four. Uh, so exponentiate both sides is 10 to the 4 is d over 10 parsecs. So that means that d is equal to 10 to the 5 parsecs. 100,000 parsecs. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a thing. Okay, uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of 100,000 parsecs. Fantastination. Okay, so this is kind of terrifying. We have low mass stars, which we can barely see out anywhere in the galaxy. And then we have these uh, other stars, which we can see in distant galaxies, other nearby galaxies uh, with uh, Gaia. And so this means that the volume for completeness for the bright stars that we used here is a trillion times larger than the volume for the faint stars. And so while there aren't that many high mass stars in the galaxy, uh, from the IMF, uh, they are produced, this huge volume over which we can see them more than compensates for their, uh, their rarity. But even with those factors, if I go into this uh, Gaia plot, which I should have probably stuck in here, there still aren't that many O and B stars in our nice volume. There's a few, like three or four maybe 10. And there's still, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of these uh, low mass stars. So there's another factor that's going on here. And that other factor is lifetime. Uh, these stars have short lifetimes. Uh, so the high mass stars, if they lasted as long as low mass stars, then we would see a lot more of them because we can see them over a much larger area or a much larger volume, but their short lifetimes uh, drop down. And so we really see a much reduced relative frequency of them. So there's multiple competing effects that are explaining the number densities of stars. And so the star densities that we see in the HR diagram, it's a product of these observational selection effects, 
how the stars have been made, how many stars were made kind of per unit time, and then the lifetimes of the stars at that stage. The relative lifetimes of stars also explains why there are more main sequence stars here than there are stars on the red giant branch. These stars on the red giant branch just spend less time there. They have about a tenth of their lives are on the red giant branch compared to the main sequence. And so you find, a, like, even though there are, these are luminous stars, very bright up there on the red giant branch, we only see them because, we only see a relatively low number of them because they don't last as long as main sequence stars. These things down on the main sequence, they just stay there. So if they're red, easy to detect, uh, we can see them. So remember, whenever you're looking at these HR diagrams, you are seeing not the stars that are there, but just the stars that were observed and detected. And so these observational biases and these lifetime effects all end up shaping uh, what you actually see in terms of the numbers of stars. The next thing that we want to consider is interstellar dust. Interstellar dust is a, uh, we've mentioned it before, it's this weird soot-like substance that's mixed in through the neutral gas of the galaxy. And dust has three effects. We've mentioned two of them, but a third one's gonna be real important soon. Uh, the first one is that it blocks optical light. It specifically blocks shorter wavelength light, or bluer light, more than long wavelength light, or redder light. And the light that it absorbs, we haven't talked about this, gets re-radiated in the infrared. So when we look at galaxies, we will see their light has, sh uh, uh, their blocked light can actually come out and be re-radiated in infrared, thermal infrared emission. So when we look at uh, structures in the interstellar medium, this is a weird little object called uh, B68 or Buck globule number 68. And uh, when we look at it, we can look at it in different colors of light. In the optical uh, image, we've made a three color image. And the way it works is this is BVI. So that is blue visible and the red side of uh, the optical band. And what we do is we encode this into an RGB image, a red, green, blue image, where the blue is the B band image, the green stars or the green color channel is embedded in the v-band image and then the i-band is embedded in the r channel of the image and so things that are red in this image i think that's red uh, are um, things that are basically have more light in these longer wavelength bands but these are all optical bands. I think the I band is around 800 nanometers. And so that's, a, I guess, a little long word of the um, actual visible part of the spectrum, but it's in the very near infrared. This K band is hanging out at like 2.2 microns. And so the image on the left is the image you say, if you, if you see, if you embed uh, the infrared into the red channel of the image. And so the things that only show up at this 2.2 micron band are things that will show up that are red features in this um, image. And you can sort of basically see straight through the cloud in the infrared because the dust blocks the blue light more than the red light. And so this is what we mean when we say the stars are reddened. Uh, that just means that they have their blue light removed. Even in this optical image, if you look around the perimeter of Bach globule 68, you'll see that the emission is red uh, compared to the fa uh, field population of background stars, which are kind of more blue and white. The stars that you see through the edge of the cloud are red. And that ends up getting blocked out uh, more and more by the dust as you're sort of looking uh, through it, eventually till you get into the center of the cloud where you just can't see any uh, further in the optical, but you put on your infrared glasses and can see straight into uh, the clouds, which is pretty nifty. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, sort of working out how much extinction a population of dust would uh, create, uh, a population of dust would create, so we can relate the properties of dust to the uh, extinction that we see in, uh, the, in whatever wave band we're looking at. 
And we'll use a very toy model for this. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider a population of spherical dust grains, each of which has radius r, uh, that are sitting in this path of a cylindrical beam of light that's carrying power p. And what I want to know is what's the value of delta p, which is the change in the power because of these objects here that are blocking uh, the light. I've sort of indicated that the diameters of those spheres are 2r, uh, so one radius is r. And so they're going to be distributed along a path here of length l, and for uh, calculus purposes I'll end up considering just the thin slice of that, which is a differential length l. Uh, yeah, so I have also defined the cylinder to have a cross-sectional area of A. So this is the setup. I basically want to say, well, how much power gets blocked out by those uh, dust grains? And so if I take this uh, situation here and I look at it end, end on, let's get a slightly more circular version. There we are, that's a circle. And I'm looking at these things uh, and I see straight end on to the cylinder, those spherical grains basically look like, oops, I got a, uh, shit. They look like three little circles here. And so the fundamental physical reasoning here is that the fraction of power that's lost is the fraction of area covered by those spheres. So the, we can basically say that the power that gets passed through, this is the opposite statement, oops, is the power that's going through this kind of blue dotted area here. So we see that the power after we pass through this area relative to the power going in is going to be equal to the area of the whole cylinder minus the area covered by these little uh, spheres. And so that's going, to, we're gonna, I'm gonna write that as fancy n, which is going to be the number of spheres along the way. And so times the area, pi r squared, of those uh, spheres. So they're spheres, but when I look at them from far away, they just look like circles. So that's why the area that they project to is pi r squared, even though they are spherical objects. They look like circles. And then I'm going to say that that's the power coming out, which is the area, uh, which is basically the blue dot uh, area in the cylinder, uh, divided by the total area. So this is just a ratio. The power that's uh, power afterwards over the power before is the area that is unoccupied over the total area. So that's my setup, and at this point, it's all over but the shouting. Uh, all the physics is done, now we just have to do a little setup. So the first thing that I need to do in this physics setup is I need to know that the number of those spheres in an arbitrary volume here of, uh, of the cylinder, I'm gonna consider the just inside this DL here, this area here. That is the number density of the dust grains, which I've given a, a name little n, times the area of the cylinder, that's A, times the thickness of the cylinder. So that's basically just this volume here in the cylinder. I'm gonna, that's ugly, uh, so I'm gonna take it away. Uh, so that's n times a times dl. There'd be like it's a cylinder, so I could relay it to the radius of the cylinder if I want, but it's just the area of the end cap times the thickness. That gives me that little dotted area right there. Then from here, I can solve for uh, uh, delta p. So I say that delta p, is, ooh, let's just say it's p plus delta p. And that's going to be equal to p times the area minus the number, I'll stick that in, n times a times dl times the area of each sphere all over a. And you'll notice now that there's an a in each term, so I'm going to cancel that out. I'll multiply in the power. Oops, let's go back to my right in color. Uh, p plus delta p is equal to p minus p times n times pi r squared times dl. And then I'll cancel off those p's 
and I just get that that delta p as desired is negative p times n pi r squared dl. So this is basically the fraction or the little bit of power lost in traversing that thickness dl. Um, and I need to make sure it's a little thickness because, as opposed to using the whole cylinder all at once because what happens if the two uh, spheres happen to pass in front of each other? And so there's this kind of eclipse as you're looking down the cylinder. Well, in that case, I can't quite count things correctly uh, here. And so I could end up blocking more light than, you know, if I just do that naively, I'd end up blocking more light than is excuse me, permitted uh, in going through uh, the cylinder. So it's basically the area of the spheres would be larger than the area of the cylinder. So that would that, that would be cool. Uh, so we've set this thing up and you may have noticed that my choice of DL is kind of leading and this little differential difference delta P for a tiny, oh, I really, I didn't finish my thought. So by considering just the thin little DL, we can basically guarantee that there's only a tiny fraction of a sphere in each little layer. And then we'll use calculus to add up and treat the variation of the, um, uh, basically the treat the variation of power accounting for this, um, uh, the spherical overlap problem. So in that limit there. So I, I, you know, I know that not everybody in this class has seen the full glory of one-dimensional differential equations, and that's cool. Uh, the outcome is what we're after, so don't panic. So first off, in passing to that, uh, that differential limit in DL, I can also consider the differential loss in the power. So I'm gonna make that uh, delta P into a DP, engaging in what mathematicians like to call a gross abuse of differential forms. So that's P times N times pi R squared times DL. And from here, this is a separable differential equation and I can uh, basically put all of the p's on one side, so I'll divide through by p, and I get dp over p is equal to n pi r squared dl. And then what I want to integrate from is basically integrating from the initial power that's going in to the final power that's coming out. And then I'm going to say that that's the same as integrating across the length of the cylinder. So I'll go from zero up to L. And so that's the full length of the cylinder. And from here, I can integrate this. That is uh, uh, the natural log. And I can put in a P final over a P initial there. And then over here, the only thing that depends on L is the DL. So this just becomes minus n times pi r squared times l. And then I can solve this by exponentiating both sides and I get that the final power is the initial power e to the minus n times pi r squared times l. And I'm actually gonna give the cross-sectional area of the solid sphere a special name. I'm just gonna call that uh, sigma. So I'm gonna call this a little sigma, because that's the variable we use for cross-section. And so we end up with uh, p final is equal to p initial e to the minus n sigma l. And so that tells me that as I'm going through here, we start to basically exponentially drop off and get uh, things extinguished uh, as we go. So I think that I do want to say one other thing is that this allows me to then relate uh, this quantity here. Oh, sorry, I should say that we define the quantity tau to be the optical depth. And so if you've been through 320, you probably maybe have seen optical depth. I don't know whether they're teaching opacity these days. Back in my day, we always taught opacity. Anyways, um, and then we can relate the optical depth to a magnitude. So uh, tau is the optical depth, I should say, boop, boop, is equal to n sigma l. And then we can use the magnitude uh, 
relationship to sort of express how the optical depth is related to uh, the change in flux. So remember, from the magnitude system, m, uh, let's say m1 minus m2, uh, let's, let's be better about this. Let's stick with a consistent notation. We can say that m final minus m initial is negative 2.5 log 10 of the p final over p initial. And we've already solved that as uh, using the rules of logs. We can say that m final minus m initial is negative 2.5, 2.5 log 10, I should note that this is base 10, and we've got a natural log running around there, of e to the minus n sigma l. So we were had m final minus m initial is minus 2.5 log base 10 of e to the optical depth because that's the n sigma l. And then from the rules of logs, I'll pop that exponent out and I'll get plus 2.5 tau log base 10 of e is m final minus m initial. And if I take 2.5 log base 10 e, I get 1.086 times the optical depth. And then this difference between the final and the initial magnitude we're going to call the extinction A. So that's the extinction. So now we have the ability to measure the extinction in magnitudes for a, the light of a star passing through a dust cloud if we know the properties of those dust grains. That's optical depth. Wow, what a powerful kind of day. Are there any questions about the derivation that I went through there? All right, not seeing much popping out, so I'm going to hand things over to you to approach this problem. Consider a dust cloud with dust grains that have size r equals 1 micron and a number density of 10 to the minus 6 per meter cubed. If the path length through the dust cloud is 10 parsecs, how, how many, uh, magnitudes of extinction are between the observer and a background star? So I've given you the relevant equations here. And the path through this problem is to basically stick the problems into the optical depth, figure out the magnitudes of extinction, and you just have to be careful about unit conversion. All right, seems like we're getting some responses in. I'm going to start 
uh, uh, heading through the uh, problem. So this optical depth tau, we'll start up by calculating it and say, well, and then we're going to stick it into the extinction. So the expression we want is really just a one-liner. We say the extinction A is 1.086 uh, times the optical depth, and the optical depth is the volume density, which is 10 to the minus 6 per meter cubed. The cross-section is pi times 10 to the minus 6 quantity squared. And then the path length is 10 parsecs, and each parsec is 3.086 times 10 to the 16 meters per parsec. And so then we can cancel everything out. Oh, I need a meter squared, because then we have a meter squared times a meter, and it's a meter cubed, divided by a meter cubed parsec parsec. Dimensionless. Magnitudes are dimensionless. If I grind all of that out, I get an answer of 1.05 magnitudes of extinction. And so this will block out one magnitude of extinction worth of light. All right, how do we do? We did all right. We're feeling okay. Maybe not great, because we've got a midterm on Friday, but we're definitely feeling all right. Uh, okay. Last thing to talk about is cross-sections are a theoretical construct in physics. We've been focusing on what's called the geometric cross-section, which is just the sort of solid, you know, sphere. This is where the light will get blocked uh, by it. But in, cro in physics, we often deal with things like subatomic particles or whatever that aren't solid spheres. And so we generalize this concept of cross-section into this idea where I'm going to basically imagine sort of sending a bunch of uh, incident particles down through an area A, and I have a bunch of targets in there. Uh, and I'm going to count the number of things that those targets, a uh, number of times those targets get collided with. And then I can form this cross-section sigma as this ratio, and a number of collisions I have over the number of targets all over the number of incident particles per unit area. And that's kind of a difficult thing to sort of work through. So I kind of think about this in terms of a um, very inappropriate way to measure the size of a watermelon. Uh, so I conceive of this as I imagine a long hallway with like 70 watermelons uh, suspended on strings for this. I mean, I, I keep trying to get funding to do this, but they never learn. Um, so I imagine there, there's an, it has an area of 10 meters squared, and then we have a bunch of watermelons kind of tied to strings at different heights here inside this uh, hallway here. I'm not going to draw 70 watermelons here. And so then you, um, you know, you, me, whoever, uh, gets your trusty physics lab issued automatic rifle and goes and stands at one hand, end of the hall. And it's important that you send your bullets down the hallway randomly. You can't be aiming at the watermelons. That would be cheating. So whatever way you want to make sure that you randomize the trajectories of bullets, you send them down the hallway uh, at high speed, and then you sleep it off or whatever, and you walk down the hallway and you count the number of watermelons that have been exploded. And so let's say we're going down here, we suspended 70 watermelons, we shot 100 bullets randomly down the hallway, and we find that there are 35 watermelons that have been exploded. So half of them made it, half of them didn't. And we can use this to measure the size of a watermelon uh, given this general, uh, generalized notion of a cross-section, so, which is basically the number of collisions over the number of targets divided by the number of uh, incident particles per unit area. And so we just have to pick out the parts of the problem that correspond to this. So the number of collisions were the number of watermelons that got destroyed by bullets, so that would be 35. There were 70 possible targets, and then the number of incident particles were 100, and that's per 10 meters squared. So we sent them down per 10 meters squared and, you know, basically made a bunch of watermelon jam. Um, and so if you put all of these numbers in, you end up with uh, a half 0 0.05 meters squared. 
and I calculated this earlier, but I've lost my calculation. Uh, so that corresponds to a radius of 0 0.05 of pi of radius of 12.6 centimeters. Oh, 12 point, yeah, 12.6 centimeters. So you've basically measured the size of a watermelon this way. I did, seriously, don't try this at home. But this is the notion behind generalized cross-section, is you don't necessarily measure the geometric area, but you define a geometric area based on the probabilities of interaction for an incident flux of particles, be they bullets or photons, and a number of targets that you have collisions from. That's going to become important because we're going to see that cross-section can vary with wavelength because of the optical properties. And so we can't stick with this just fixed spherical object geometry here. We have to sort of think about uh, cross-section under this more generalized uh, case. All right, that's it. Uh, I'll see you on Friday to take midterm number one. And uh, it's going to be a great time. I mean, seriously. If you have further questions, please hit me up on the Discord, send me an email. Uh, we'll work things out. I'll have office hours tomorrow from 10.30 a.m. till noon. But if you need some other time and that doesn't work for you, please just send an email. We'll be able to figure it out. Otherwise, have a lovely day and I'll see you later.